Hey everyone, Alien Theory here, and I'm not quite done talking about pan and scan releases just yet. Recently, I talked about the full screen version of Alien vs. Predator, and in doing so, I ended up looking back previously to a video I made about the original 1979 Alien and the home video version on VHS. It was, of course, presented in pan and scan to fit the 4x3 aspect ratio of a standard television set at the time. I did some comparisons there, but really kind of bullet points, and I think showing a great deal of restraint because there's a lot more I have to say about it and of Aliens and Alien 3. That's what I wanted to take a closer look at today and go through these in some further detail. So turn the lights off, fire up the CRT television set, pop a tape in the VCR, and let's take a look at Alien versus Pan and Scan. Firstly, we have the titles, which I've sped up here to get a better idea. The title Alien and the credits which appear along with the background imagery is noticeably scrunched up here. It's just too wide taking up the whole screen in the 2x39.1 format. This was a common problem for movies being presented in 4x3 at the time, and depending on how exactly the titles were presented, you'd either see them scrunched up like this or you'd actually see the title shown in letterbox format with the black bars on the top and bottom of the screen. Alien opted for the tight squeeze because there isn't a hard cut between the end of the titles and the reveal of the Nostromo, but a fade. So the very first time we see the Nostromo, it is looking a little thinner than maybe it should. And of course we get the additional text on the screen, giving us the overview of what's going on, also scrunched. Actually kind of hard to read. I think actually when first watching the movie, and yes, the first time I watched it, it was like this on VHS, I had to pause the tape. But we finally get into non-squeeze territory, and we see the shots of the ship. With the image limitations, it's not quite as vast and awe-inspiring as it should be, but arguably still gets the job done. When we see inside the ship, and the camera guides us through the Nostromo, I think we lose a fair deal of perspective. The halls just don't feel as long and deep-stretching into the darkness. The sets they built here are no doubt incredible, it's just that we're seeing much less of them than what was intended. It hurts the atmosphere a little bit, since this is such a crucial moment to open the film. To set up the atmosphere, and let us get a sense of the environment where we'll be spending most of the movie. When we approach the cryopods of the Nostromo's crew, we get an even more blatant example of just what exactly is being taken away from us in the 4x3 format. Theatrically, this is a great, wide shot. We see pods opening up, and it's just this beautifully composed image. Not so much with the pan and scan. It's locked, right into the middle. And what's worse is when we see Kane waking up. An artistic choice to show the slow passing of time, there are some fades here, and there's no choice but to create an artificial pan from one fade to another. It's supposed to be still and calm, but now we have a camera movement that was never intended. You'll also notice just how bright the room is. That's another thing about this VHS version, and how I guess the feeling was the run-of-the-mill television just couldn't pick up on the darker imagery at the time. God forbid it would end up looking like AVP Requiem or something. But it's just not supposed to be this bright. I remember the first time watching a widescreen version of the film, not on DVD, but on a remastered VHS which came out in the late 90s, just being shocked at the difference. Of everything that stood out to me was actually the mother room. It looked so white and bright in the previous versions I've seen. As you can see in the comparison here, it's pretty night and day. It is a drastic difference. And here we get the group conversation, Dallas informing the group of Mother waking them all up, and the distress call. It's pretty tightened up here, and not too bad when you look at the shots of Ash, Kane, and Dallas, and the shots of Ripley and Lambert. But you have this system of class being communicated subtly through these shots. The male officers, the female officers, but then in their own shots, their own little world are Parker and Brett. The lower class of the group, the engineer and the technician. And poor Harry Dean Stanton, he's being cut out, panned away from, and the focus goes to Yafet Kato. Why? Because he's the character talking. That's what dictates the focus of pan and scan. So unfortunately, you miss a lot of Harry Dean's quiet nuances as Brett. Then we have the approach to LV-426. It's this big, sweeping scene. We see the vastness of the Nostromo and its refinery, and we see how the crew operates. In order to get an idea of the scope of the Nostromo, as it makes its way to LV-426, they have to artificially pan the camera once again. Both the planet and the ship are spread across one shot, so the only alternative would have been to show half the planet and half the ship. If I'm not mistaken, that's LV-223 to the right of the screen in the widescreen version in this shot. 
The VHS cuts that out, but I suppose that's okay because Prometheus was still a few decades away from being released. One thing that also stands out about the brightness on the VHS version is how it overexposes some of the special effects. Somehow this shot of Ash and the view from his window looks far less convincing in full screen, and the models of the Nostromo actually end up looking a little more obviously like models. The miniature effects in this movie are superb. I think honestly they hold up just as well as anything being done today in CGI. But the thing is, if you don't display them right, where they're not allowed the necessary coverage or lack of coverage in the light, it's going to give them away a little bit. This shot here makes the kind of compromise I was speaking of earlier. There's no panning here. Instead, we're stuck in the middle. We basically get half the ship and half the planet. If you're curious about the exact sources being used for this comparison, the VHS source is the 1992 release and the widescreen source is the 2011 Blu-ray version. You could definitely make some arguments about which version is the true visual representation of Alien. The 1999 DVD, the 2003 DVD, the 2011 Blu-ray, and for sure the latest 4K release all look very different. But I think that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down, so maybe best saved for another day. Another beautiful shot here, but with slight panning as the action moves in the full screen version. Then Ash's console, a broad, ominous looking setup, but limited to the square picture and not quite as daunting. The group treks along the surface of LV-426 and you can see that the VHS version has taken away the sun. I'm pretty sure that's symbolic of something. This view of the derelict ship, revealed in the film for the first time, again seems to look more obviously as a model in parts due to the brightness, but also due to the significant zoom in on the image for the 4x3 version. This shot of Lambert, Kane, and Dallas is one of, if not my favorite, shot in the film. This just says, sci-fi, dangerous journey into the unknown to me. It is a wonderful image of the trio, but being changed in full screen, it's more of a duo. Lambert is missing entirely here. I've been able to catch showings of Aliens in theaters three separate times in my life, all within the last ten years or so. Each in separate theaters, all digital projection, though I'd jump at the chance to see it screened on 35mm film, and I hope someday I do get that chance, or even 70mm. But twice I saw it in chain theaters, with the giant screens as sort of a special one-night-only event. And what really stands out is the Giger work. It is art, and it's displayed in such a way that your eyes sort of scan it from side to side to take it all in. Like with the derelict, and with the space jockey. It is very unfortunate for the space jockey in the full screen version, because that big reveal just doesn't have the same effect that it should have in taking up the entire 239 by one frame. It's cut off pretty significantly. I don't think an artificial scan would have worked either, so I'm glad they didn't go for that. If they did, it must have been extremely subtle. But of all the casualties of the 4x3 ratio presentation, no doubt it's the space jockey. Another noticeable and distracting pan here. Ash back on the Nostromo to the derelict because there is a fade. But Ash is on the left side of the screen, and the more interesting part of the derelict is on the right. With Kane investigating the egg, it looks like the egg takes up the entirety of the screen, when in reality there's more in the background. We don't see the entirety of the egg as it opens up, but it's good enough, I guess. Once the facehugger leaps out at him, we have another exterior shot of the derelict after the initial shock. It's a nice, slow zoom out, but unfortunately, a good deal of it is cut off here. When we get to the reveal of the facehugger, something strange happens. Now, I was fairly certain I had this side-by-side -side footage synced up pretty well, but all of a sudden, things are not matching. I thought maybe it had something to do with how I captured the footage, but here is a rabbit hole I just have to go down. As I mentioned earlier, the VHS source is a 1992 release, but prior to that one of the more widely circulated home video versions is a release from CBS Fox in 1984. There were other releases, but if you ever watched Alien on VHS in the 80s or 90s, it was likely one of these. Not that I want to go on a tangent in the middle of an already in progress tangent here, but in comparing the 1984 VHS to the 1992 VHS, a few key differences certainly stand out. The 1984 release is darker, which I do think is good, but the overall image is a little washed out and has noticeably less definition in the picture quality. While the 1992 release may be a little bit on the bright side, what we get in the positive aspects are a crisper image quality and fuller color. 
I would argue that it's ultimately the superior version. Not exactly leaps and bounds in terms of improvement over an 8 year time span, but if I were stuck back in the early 90s and had to choose a certain version to watch, I would go with the 1992 tape. For what it's worth, it also has a Dolby surround audio mix, which the 1984 release lacks. The video source for each, though, seems to be the same. If you look really, really closely, you'll even notice identical instances of film grain appearing on the screen. So what's important, for the purposes of this video anyway, is that the pan and scan process is exactly the same for both. It has the exact same cropping of the image for each and every shot. It has the exact same panning of the image when it is needed. And with all that comes the same omission of footage when we first see the facehugger. We can compare this pan and scan version to any other widescreen home video release and the cut becomes clear. A slight bit over two seconds has been removed from the pan and scan version. Ash removes the remnants of Kane's helmet and we see the facehugger's tail wrap around his neck. This part of the shot is not in the pan and scan version of the film on VHS. This is true of the 1984 release, and it's true of the 1992 release. In 1999, however, Alien was released in full screen on VHS for one last time, as part of the digitally remastered 20th anniversary set, and it's a completely new print. For example, in this release, the credits are presented in the original widescreen format, as is the shot of the Nostromo with the informative text that follows. It then switches to the full screen format once we get the first shot of the ship scaling across the screen. And, in this version, the missing two seconds is restored. You'll also notice it's framed differently from the 1992 and 1984 print, but it's there. So isn't that interesting? For the better part of two decades, the most prominently circulated releases of Alien for home viewing was actually missing footage. I'd wager any television broadcasts also used the same print found on these releases, whether it was the HBO broadcast or any other edited network version. So unless you saw it at the theater, or happened to be a laser disc or widescreen VHS enthusiast, if you saw Alien for the first time between 1980 and 1999, it's likely you saw this print. Not only compromised in aspect ratio, but actually missing footage. Why were these two seconds removed? I have no idea. Did they need to make a trim somewhere for the movie to fit properly on a certain kind of VHS type for mass production, and these two seconds were as good as any other to remove? Your guess is as good as mine. If you happen to know definitively, or you have any inside information on this, I would absolutely love to know. But for now, it's a mystery to me. Moving on though, we have more of the of the norm pan and scan offenses. There's a lot an actor can do with body movements or positioning to convey certain things about the character and the scene. During Ripley's confrontation with Ash, he places his hand on his hip. There's of course impatience being communicated physically here. She's interrupting something he no doubt finds fascinating. There's also some superiority. Who are you to come in here and question me like this? Do you really think you're in charge? Because you're not. And it's kind of an aggressive stance. He doesn't want this human looking into things too much. In order to capture both Ripley and Ash in the frame, unfortunately, half his body is invisible as intended. We lose quite a bit when Dallas, Ripley, and Ash search for the missing facehugger. It's one of the great tense moments of the movie. We're meant to be sort of looking around the screen along with the characters. It could be anywhere, hiding in any corner. We're visually participating, even if it's in an unconscious way, but it becomes limited when we're essentially told who and what to look at on the screen. The character on screen will always take priority in the pan and scan version, no matter where they originally were in the frame. With pan and scan, more often than not, they're centered. Here we have a slight pan with Harry Dean Stanton in this shot. You miss a lot of stuff in the background in this scene. This whole conversation taking place between different characters on different sides of this little nook in the crew quarters is separated by different shots. They're in different pairings than what we saw earlier, almost suggesting an equality has formed since Kane has been facehugged. The ship's captain and the engineer slump together side by side. Another pan is necessary here as Dallas rises up to speak to Lambert. When Kane awakes, the furthest characters get cut out of the shot, Lambert and Brett, unless of course they have some dialogue and their own shot like here with Harry Dean with his Freezerinos line. The notorious Last Supper scene begins with a slow pan across the table instead of a stagnant shot. It's necessary in the full screen version to establish everyone's there. 
We have Ripley cut off of a shot here while Ash is speaking, Dallas gleefully drinking his Aspen beer, and Lambert's cigarette peeking into the frame are cut off to focus on Parker and Kane. And the nightmare begins. The alien makes its grand appearance. The chestburster scene is, of course, one of the most memorable scenes of this or any movie, really. Surely tapes were worn out, rewinding it and watching it over and over again. Not just because it's so shocking and because of the special effects being so good, but to see the reactions from the actors. I love seeing Brett just behind Parker here, trying to help, cigarette still in his mouth. That's missing in 4x3. This reaction from Dallas is great. You see the complete shock and terror in his eyes. That's cut off. You can also see Ash dodge the blood that sprays all over Lambert here, barely noticeable in the full screen version. More of Dallas cut off. The blood-drenched Lambert can't be seen. Unfortunately, we miss a lot. Really, Scott is just so masterful at staging, and there's so many different ways that he's able to put his characters and cast together, and shot in an interesting way. We see a perfect example of this during Kane's makeshift funeral. It's a wonderfully composed shot, sadly cropped off at the sides here. And even in the scene that follows, we have the group planning on capturing the tiny creature that has emerged from Kane, unbeknownst to them, has already begun to grow rapidly. We alternate between the shots of the trios. But we can't fit three characters in 4x3 with these shots, so whoever is speaking gets to be in frame, and when necessary, we have to see an artificial pan. Another shot I love is when Parker, Brett, and Ripley believe they have the alien cornered, and they get the net ready. It's a great shot of the three characters, but just completely ruined in having to translate it for the square TV screen. And much like the earlier scene with the search for the facehugger in MedLab, Brett's lone search for the cat is all about creating a slow-building tension. This time, inarguably, with an even more terrifying payoff. We're alone with Brett in this cavernous section of the ship. The alien could be anywhere. We search the screen for possible clues. And just a side note here, the 2003 director's cut of the film includes an additional shot where we actually see the alien hanging in the chains above. When I made a video long ago comparing the theatrical cut to the director's cut, I argued that it kind of gives away the surprise too early. But I ended up hearing from quite a few people in the comments that they actually didn't even notice the alien until a repeat viewing. I think that just goes to show how well this scene works and how effectively it can create a certain kind of fear and expectation in your mind. It says a lot that when the subject of the fear is right in front of you, you may very well miss it. I wonder if they could have gotten away with keeping this shot in back in 1979, and I wonder how it may have looked changed to full screen. Without the more sprawling aspect ratio and the heightened brightness, I'm not quite sure the alien would be as elusive. When the alien finally reveals itself to Brett and attacks, it's honestly not too bad. Mostly thanks to the way it was originally shot anyway, with some areas of the screen obscured by darkness or steam, so we're technically not missing important visual cues. But in the scene that follows, we actually have the only instance of the film of an artificial camera cut. Lambert on one side of the screen asks if Brett could still be alive, and Ripley on the other side responds. One shot in the widescreen version is transformed into two in the full screen, and probably a better alternative to quick awkward panning from one side of the screen between dialogue. A good sense of claustrophobia is created when Dallas is in the vents. Also another example of the way the scene was shot, keeping areas of the screen in the darkness simply not conveyed in the full screen version. I mentioned this the last time around, but when the alien is revealed here, it's just so much better seeing it in its full scope. The hands are on each side, filling up the screen. It's like the alien is grabbing right at you. Cropped, we mainly focus on the face. We see a little bit of the hands, but it's just not as effective. Unfortunately, there's just simply no way around this. Unless they were to go for the bold move of stretching the image to fit the screen, like some other shots, but that would surely look ridiculous. These pan and scan presentations are full of compromises and fortunate decisions to make. The crew dwindles and are positioned differently in camera in the scenes that follow. I like these opposite shots of Ripley and Lambert. Lambert is all the way at the edge of the screen in her shots. She's deteriorating a little bit. She's distant. Both literally, as we see visually communicated, but of course she's far away from Ripley when it comes to what the group wants to do next. The three characters determined to stay on the ship leave her side, and she's left on her own, outvoted. The image isn't quite as powerful in the square framing. 
It's a little awkward here, with Ripley speaking to Parker, who is on the other side of the frame out of focus. We see the full picture in the intended aspect ratio, but in the 4x3 format, it's as if Parker is speaking to Ripley off-screen. It probably wouldn't make too much sense to either pan or create an artificial cut to a character that's slightly blurred. Ripley gains access to Mother, and these shots echo the earlier ones of Dallas, conveying that Ripley is in charge now. The pure scope of the mother womb, as Scott called it, doesn't come across as strongly. Ash is revealed to be an android working in the company's interest and is interrogated in one of the film's most memorable scenes, among countless memorable scenes. I just love the visual here. A disembodied head speaking while his body is literally right next to him. It's so bizarre and morbid. Sadly, this intriguing visual is compromised. The full-screen version has to focus very literally on the talking head. Also, you barely even notice Lambert is in the scene since she's cut off and silent for the most part until she actually has some dialogue in her own shot. And one thing you definitely miss in the pan and scan version is that among all the items scattered on the table with Ash's body is his motion tracker. It's torched along with him, for as much good as it would do them anyway, and kind of a final fuck you to the treacherous android. Micro changes in air density, my ass. We have some more panning as the group splits up and Ripley goes off on her own. This really nice shot of Ripley, framed inside from basically the point of view of the corridor, is compromised here. When the alien makes its appearance and looms over Lambert, we miss a little bit of the image. Also, since it's fairly dark and VHS isn't exactly the most clear in its image presentation, we miss out on some visual details of the beast. And when it turns its sights to Parker, we get that close-up of the Jaws, which is even more close-up in full frame. The alien is only seen in a few precious shots throughout the entirety of the movie, so every single second we see it has to make an impact. And I think, given the circumstances, they do probably as well as they possibly could have with this presentation. Ripley's on her own, she begins the self-destruct process. We see her on one side, and the self-destruct board opening up on the other side, so we have to pan. Needless to say, it's a frantic scene, Ripley's in a panic, and she darts from one side of the screen to another in this next shot, creating the need for a quick pan which looks a little silly. The visual effects shots of the Nostromo blowing up aren't perfect, but I think they're presented fairly enough in the 4x3 format. Both in shots where it's off to the side, and some of the framing of the shuttle has to be cut, and the fuller shots which communicate, well, a big explosion. Another aside here, you can actually see the cue mark for the final reel in this shot. I think that's kind of cool. Assuming you're unfamiliar with cue marks or haven't seen Fight Club, the short explanation is that it's a quick circular image that would appear in the top corner of the screen that signaled to the projectionist that the reel would need to be changed. Back when films were actually shown on film and projected that way, a movie would consist of several reels containing about 15 to 20 minutes of the movie. Each reel would have to be changed as the movie went along. The projectionist would keep an eye out for these cues and make damn sure the reels were presented in the right order. If you're an older viewer on this channel, you may very well have some funny stories of reel mix-ups because sooner or later it would happen. The lower tier grindhouse theaters of the 70s and 80s were practically famous for it and for even missing entire reels. It just goes to show how important the role of projectionist once was. It was a noble profession, requiring skill and discipline. The projectionist would have to control these reels and look out for the cues. They'd have to make sure the framing and focus was precise. They'd have to make sure the projector's bulb was operating correctly and change it as needed in order to avoid a burnout halfway through a screening. Tragically, now, a lost art. These days, some 14-year-old presses a button on a digital projector with a bulb operating at 75% capacity, at best, in order to save a little money, we pray to God it's framed correctly, and we all munch on $20 bags of popcorn and pretend it's acceptable. We used to be a proper country. But anyway, when these movies were transferred from the film source to VHS, everything with the reels seemed to come along with it. Little specks of grain and lint, all the charming imperfections in a pre-digital world, and the cue marks. Since more often than not, the cue would be on a side of the screen that was cut off anyway, you wouldn't always see it. But depending on the framing, sometimes you could. Ripley faces off against the alien, blows it out of the goddamn airlock, and saves the day. When she goes into hypersleep, the movie ends with a fade to the credits, so this last shot has to be squeezed. That is, at least, the case for the 1984 and 1992 VHS releases of the film. 
the 1999 tape actually tries something a little different, which is interesting to say the least. Let's take a look at how they navigated this fade to credits and compare. Wow, that's something, isn't it? The home video market was a relatively new thing by the time Alien was released, and I think they did the best they could given the circumstances. There was never going to be a perfect translation between the wide theatrical presentation and the square television presentation for this and countless other movies that found their way to home libraries at the time. It's imperfect, but it worked as well as it could for the time. The James Cameron sequel followed many years later, and in that span of time, the home video market changed drastically. In 1980, there was no such thing as blockbuster video, let alone a mega chain all over North America. But by 1987, when Aliens came to VHS, they were all over. VHS was the way to go for a night in at the movies, at home. Aliens was presented theatrically in the 1.85 to 1 aspect ratio, not as wide as Alien, and the translation to 4x3 shows just how much more comfortable the pan and scan process could be. You'd see many more movies at the time lean a little bit more toward that aspect ratio, with the eventual home video release being considered. To be clear, this was not the case with Aliens, and not the reason for the aspect ratio it used. James Cameron himself has said he seriously considered filming in Super 35, which would have given it a 2.35 to 1 aspect ratio. He was, however, convinced by a colleague to shoot in 1.85 to 1 because it would aid in the heavy visual effects work needed for the production. Cameron somewhat lamented this decision, and felt there was a noticeable difference in visual continuity between Ridley Scott's film and his especially when viewed theatrically, and especially when presented back-to-back. -back. Who knows how it could have ended up if it were shot in Super 35, but with the aspect ratio ultimately used, it certainly didn't hurt its VHS release. As you can see, there's a lot less that ends up needing to be cut off from either side of the screen, and in most cases, it's hardly noticeable. Maybe here and there a character won't be seen on the screen, such as Newt here in the APC with Ripley, Gorman, and Burke. And maybe here and there there will be a pan as necessary, but without a vast distance of screen to travel, it's usually very subtle. And even considering some imagery that may have been a problem, such as the views from the Marines' helmet cams, it's actually saved because we're never given a complete, unrestricted view of the heads-up display in the first place. Technically, it's supposed to be the point of view of those in the APC, not the Marines themselves. A little text cut off here and there does nothing to detract from the images we're given. So there's not really a whole lot to nitpick here. It's fine enough. It's acceptable. It's the norm at the time. Obviously, the widescreen version is superior, and that's what we watch today and how any new viewer will see it. I do remember, though, back in the late 90s when I was first discovering all about widescreen, believing that every movie was more or less the same case. I didn't really know much about different aspect ratios, so after finding the widescreen VHS tapes of Alien and Alien 3 and being blown away by those differences, I was expecting the same for Aliens. I remember I actually had to special order it from HMV and waited weeks in anticipation. Then in finally getting to see it in widescreen, having it dawn on me that not everything was going to be this huge revelation. Which was fine, because it was digitally remastered in THX and looked great and everything, so I was happy with that. And as you can see, the movie has improved quite a bit visually from what we had in the early VHS days. The references here are the 1992 VHS release and the 2011 Blu-ray release of Aliens, and they just about look like different movies. I could surely go down another rabbit hole with this one too, since you would see a difference between the Blu-ray, the 2003 DVD, and the 1999 DVD. This bluish tone it now dons may be a source of controversy for some, but I like it in this case. I don't think it makes a compromise to the visuals, and the painstaking process of going into the film frame by frame absolutely shows. Bringing up the Predator Ultimate Hunter Edition Blu-ray again, they basically just ran it through a computer program and determined that any kind of film grain was bad, digitally reduced or removed it, and took a lot of the detail captured on film along with it. Aliens has always been a grainy film, and it is retained still, but to the highest possible standards in high definition. If there's a reason we've been waiting, what, 57 years for the 4K version, it's probably because it's also being held to impossibly high standards. And I'm sure the James Cameron seal of approval. It wouldn't hurt if they hurried it up a little bit, though. But we've come a long way. And even if you first found Aliens on VHS in the 4x3 compromised aspect ratio, 
I have to say, it wasn't horribly butchered, which is nice, and which is not really something I can say the same for when it comes to Alien 3. It was decidedly more visually congruent with the original film, using the same 2.39 by 1 aspect ratio for its theatrical presentation, and the eventual home video translation to 4x3 is even more problematic. The first few minutes are actually presented in widescreen. It didn't seem like the trick of squishing the screen was going to work this time around. There are the title cards that sprawl across the whole screen, cut with images of the events on the Sulaco. Not to mention the on-screen graphics of Superintendent Andrew's report that informs us of the current states of the characters from the previous movie. There is a neat little effect at the end of the sequence, though. Instead of cutting simply to the next scene already in full screen, it actually slowly zooms in from the 2.39 to 1 to 4x3. This very first image in 4x3 is a slow pan across the screen, showing the retrieved EEV and the Fury 161 environment. There is an image later after we see Spike the dog barking at the facehugger of the trash heap and not-so-subtle religious imagery. You'll notice in order to fit it all, or at least most of the image on screen, it is actually altered and squished to fit the screen. Inside the assembly hall, there's some panning as Andrew speaks in order to give a better idea of the location as a whole. These are some really expensive sets, and they try their best to give home viewers watching on a square TV a chance to get a better look at them. At any given time, though, a good deal of the background is out of the shot in order to focus on whoever may be talking. One of the enduring criticisms of Alien 3 is not being able to keep track of all these characters, most of which are bald men. You can imagine how much harder it is when you can't even see them in the background in these establishing scenes. There are some noticeable cutoffs of the Maison scene of the infirmary set, but it's not too horribly affected. This, of course, is a very important location, since Ripley will have her first encounter with the alien here later. If we miss anything in this scene, we're deprived of the cheap thrill of seeing Sigourney Weaver partially nude in the frame, or more likely a double. This actually can't be seen at all in 4x3. When Ripley visits the EEV, there's a very powerful image of her with her hand on Newt's cryotube. It's a beautiful shot, but in 4x3 it's Ripley's face only, and you can't see the hand. The artistry and emotional visual communication here is partially lost. And once again, we have the image squeezed when the acid burn on the pod is discovered. Any chance to get away with doing this with inanimate objects where no one would really notice, they took. There's certainly some visual compromises in the morgue scene. David Fincher, much like Scott, has an incredible way to frame his characters. There's a lot going on in this scene by pure visuals alone. That may be sacrificed, but I suppose most importantly Sigourney Weaver's strong performance here is retained. That can come through no matter what, fortunately, and for the most part, the 4x3 gets the crucial on-screen imagery across. Sometimes, though, it is with great difficulty. See here in a brief shot where we have, from left to right, Clemens, Ripley over Newt's body, Andrews, and Aaron. The artificial camera has to make a very awkward pan to show all of that. And it has to do so very quickly, since the shot is no more than two seconds. Maybe the most awkward of the entire film is the funeral scene, where the bodies of Hicks and Newt are dropped into the furnace. The scene itself has a certain poetry to it, both in its dialogue and how it presents itself visually. It just plain doesn't translate properly from widescreen to full screen. We have the pan here from Ripley and Clemens to Andrews. That turns into a fade, showing the prisoners present at the services. With this shot in particular, we see Golic and Murphy. Then another fade, with Clemens on the other side of the frame. With 4x3, another pan is necessary to show his appearance, but of course has to move away from Andrews in order to do that. It's a nice arrangement here, in the original theatrical format. Fincher is letting his unique style come through. Maybe some would argue it's a little too showy, but regardless, it is meant to look a certain way that just can't be shown properly on this home video format. We literally have to jump from one side of the screen to another, then jump back to the side where we started. But the work isn't done yet, because in the final stroke of this cinematic painting, Ripley fades in the middle of the screen, between the doctor and superintendent. Yet another pan is required to get us in the middle of the screen and place our final focus on Ripley. The final image we're left with in the 4x3 version is just absurd. A complete butchering of the original intention. 
But to be fair, just how the hell were they going to get around it without the squish effect or inexplicably switching to the letterbox format just for one shot in the middle of the screen? The panning has to do a lot of work here, but there's an instance that follows where it just wouldn't be able to work. The bodies fall into the furnace, and there's a fade over of Ripley's eyes watching. Panning from one eye to another would just be plain strange and very hard to follow. Focusing on the middle of the screen, only partially seeing the eyes, I suppose could technically work, but would also be pretty awkward. So, in this case, they do in fact opt for the squish effect. Obviously today you can check your widescreen version, look at them side by side like I'm doing here, and it's incredibly obvious the image looks strange and squished compared to the original version, sure. But in 1992, I guess they could get away with it, because it's not like you could easily point out these differences. Really, the only somewhat practical way to do this would be if you had both the VHS copy playing on one TV with a VCR connected, next to another TV with a Laserdisc player connected playing the letterbox version on Laserdisc and syncing them both. Keeping in mind, of course, that Laserdiscs, not unlike film reels in a way, I guess, could only carry so much of the movie per disc per side. So you'd have to pause the VHS about four times throughout the viewing while you change the discs. Even with all that, there's still no way to properly record these findings unless, in addition to all that, you have some serious video editing equipment. So, really, it's all just for your own personal amusement. Unless, of course, you invite some people over to watch this grand experiment. But who in their right mind would want to come over to an Alien 3 widescreen versus full screen viewing party? Well, the joke's on you, because for all intents and purposes, you're attending one right now. In all seriousness, though, if you happened to be a big supporter of the Laserdisc format back in 1992, if you felt really passionate about it, I really don't think there would be a better example out there at the time to show the benefits than Alien 3. The whole Alien trilogy, in fact, since at least in certain cases of the first two films, the Laserdiscs came with some special features that you couldn't see anywhere else, and wouldn't be able to until the standard came along with DVD. Laserdisc, though, was probably only for the really big film enthusiasts who cared about the aspect ratio and desired to get more behind-the-scenes looks at the films and had the budget to do so. I think ultimately the masses were right in not embracing Laserdisc as a replacement for VHS. They were too big, a Laserdisc collection would end up looking like a record collection, and the requirement to get up and flip the disc just wasn't going to fly with the average couch potato. The patience for something more suitable to come along was greatly rewarded with DVD, and in the interim, such as with my own personal experience, the THX remastered widescreen VHSs worked just fine. Alien 3 was actually the very first movie I saw in widescreen, and it opened up a whole world of possibilities for me as a fan of the Alien movies and movies in general. But bringing the attention back to what's going on on screen here, we have Ripley retrieving the flight recorder from the Sulaco and some more workarounds for the full screen presentation. This time, we see some artificial cutting. Ripley is on one side of the screen, and Clemens appears on the other. First, it pans over to Clemens. In the original theatrical aspect ratio, this is all just one shot. But for the home video 4x3 screen, we're left with a choice to either pan back and forth from each side depending on who's talking, or, as we see here, there are new cuts created. When Clemens has his meeting with Andrews, there's a good shot as Clemens prepares to leave when Andrews, out of focus, makes it clear that he has the upper hand on him. Since he's not in focus, I guess he's just not that important because you can only see Clemens here. Andrews is essentially an off-screen voice. When Ripley is confronted by the group of prisoners who attempt to assault her, the manic cut once Dylan arrives makes it a little hard to follow, but it comes across good enough. There is a pretty funny instance, though, where Ripley punches the character Gregor, and the camera pans very quickly to follow the punch. There are some interesting choices in the scene in the tunnels where Boggs, Reigns, and Gallix are on a foraging expedition. We begin with a pan that shows the scale of this location. When the group discovers the candles are extinguishing, we once again see a squished image. This actually remains consistent with three different shots of the candles throughout this moment, even when it doesn't necessarily seem needed. I think it's more to make sure the audience isn't getting the sense that somehow the width of these candles are capable of fluctuating between the shots. Needless to say, the movie doesn't carry the same amount of tension as the Ridley Scott original, but the same principle remains the same in a scene like this. We have a character, alone, in a dark, wide area. We want to participate and look around ourselves, but we are limited in this interaction because the image is altered. When Reigns is attacked, there's another amusing pan. His torch has fallen to the ground. 
but the object takes up the entire screen, and the camera has to pan across the entire thing in a shot that only lasts about a second. As the rest of the scene plays out, it's not too bad, but we do get a little bit of panning. We see Boggs attacked, and a still a decent enough look at the alien before Gallic runs off. Ripley speaking to the damaged Bishop is one of my favorite scenes in the movie. This mirrors, in a way, the scene in the original with Ash. So we go from the antagonistic interrogation of a robot to one that has become a friend. This is, of course, the theatrical version, so the scene stands on its own without intercutting to the mess hall with Gallic, as we see in the assembly cut, and I do prefer seeing it this way. We miss a little bit of the image, such as the light in the shots with Ripley, which is just out of frame, but it's not too bad in the Bishop close-ups. Darkness takes up one decent portion of the screen, so the full screen doesn't bother much in capturing that, and we still get to see this amazing effect. Truly some top-notch work from ADI. When we cut to Gallic in the other part of the room, though, we begin to see more of the pan-and-scan offenses. We have artificial camera cuts here, from Andrews on one side of the screen and Aaron on the other. And we have a pan to Ripley that's not too bad since it actually moves along with the camera movement that already exists, so it's to the pan's benefit to hide within it. The most iconic shot of the movie ultimately suffers. We all know it, the image of the alien snarling, drooling right against Ripley. It's been on all the posters, the trailers, and TV spots, it's been parodied countless times, and just in general has become one of the most associated images of the series as a whole. Mind you, it is all one shot, and the camera does not move, at least not as originally intended. Firstly, the camera pans to the left since both Ripley and the alien cannot fit in this shot. Let's see that again. Pan, and to the left. Pan, and to the left. Pan, and to the left. Then an artificial shot. We go back to Ripley showing her reaction. Another artificial shot, back to the snarling alien. The inner jaw comes out, another pan, this time to the right, finding itself in the middle of the screen. Absolutely incredible. So much effort is made here to retain this original image. Every trick in the book, save for screen squishing, to bring this to the 4x3 home video presentation. A shot that was all one shot with no movements suddenly becomes three shots with two camera movements. I really have to wonder, if someone watched the movie in theaters all those years ago, then saw it again sometime later on tape or on TV, would something click here? Would they think, hey, this is different from what I remember? Maybe not every person on the street is going to know about the VHS pan and scan process and the aspect ratio differences, but certainly they'll have to at least feel something's off. And I just couldn't believe what happened next. After Andrews is snatched up by the alien, and the mess hall is in chaos, with some levity from Morse yelling fuck, I noticed there was yet again another issue with the sink. My initial instinct is to always check if something went wrong on my end. I checked, double checked, looked at different copies of my Alien 3 VHS, did some comparisons, and it would seem that we do in fact have another instance where the home video release, for some reason, cut out a tiny bit of the movie. In this case, it's the shot of Jude mopping up the blood as we bridge over to the scene with the group at the assembly hall. The shot in the theatrical widescreen version is approximately 9.03 seconds. The shot we see in the VHS full screen version is approximately 8.60 seconds. So really, we're only talking about a little over a half a second cut out of the movie. No one would really notice unless they happen to be running both versions side by side as I'm doing now. Why would they make such a cut, and why specifically be there? I'm not sure. Like with the example of the cut on Alien, maybe it was a trim to fit on mass-produced tapes, or maybe it was just a mistake. I can't really say. But what I can say is that yet again when it comes to the 1999 full-screen VHS, the full footage is restored. And needless to say, all available widescreen versions don't contain such a cut, so it is exclusive to the 1992 VHS. Jude would end up having the last laugh, however, since, as you may remember, the 2003 assembly cut version extends this moment, and we see an additional shot of Jude from the point of view of the vent. As the group readies for their big plan to catch the alien, we see some issues in showing the toxic waste tank. There's a pan here as Ripley, Aaron, and David enter to retrieve the barrels of quinitracetylene. As Ripley overviews the plan with Dylan on the outside of the tank, Aaron is just about missing completely from the shot. 
As they're mopping around the toxic sludge, Ripley begins to show signs of illness and moves from one side of the screen to another. It's necessary here for a pan to follow her. And just another gentle reminder here that this is the theatrical version, so the subplot of capturing the alien and Golic setting it free is nowhere to be seen here. In this version, the plan just doesn't work, and many of the prisoners are killed in the process. Who exactly dies? Who exactly survives? It's all very confusing and hard to keep track of, especially with the theatrical version, and even more so with it in pan and scan. Still, there are some very impressive pyrotechnics in this scene. They come across fine, and needless to say, it would still be better to see in widescreen. Ripley's scene with Aaron at the EEV when she finally discovers she's carrying an alien queen is quite interesting. We have to pan from Ripley on the left of the screen to Aaron on the right pretty quickly. It's interesting that they didn't go for the artificial cuts for this scene, but it just goes to show how awkward these pans can look when we're going back and forth in a conversation between two people on opposite ends of the screen. And there is a wild effect when Aaron discovers the bioscan has been received by the company. The text, which reads, Awaiting Acknowledgement, takes up the entire screen, so it's scrunched up here. But this image fades to the shot of the ship, the USCSS Patna, on the way to Fury. The entire screen stretches as the shot fades and we get back to the properly dimensioned image. Truly incredible. Ripley searching for the alien in the basement is a great scene, a favorite amongst admirers of the film, and one Fincher had to fight for and basically film guerrilla style. Yet another one of those participatory scenes, and this one's especially great because we have some information before Ripley does. We can see the alien behind her. That is, only if it's in the widescreen version. Very unfortunately, this shot in the VHS version omits the side of the screen where the alien hides blurred in the background. Amazingly, it's even cut out when it's brought into focus. They don't even bother to do a quick pan here. I'd guess because you'd see it in the following shot anyway as it descends on Ripley, but that's hardly the point. The 4x3 version ruins a good reveal and deprives the home video audience of a pretty cool shot of the alien. It's too bad. Ripley pleading to Dylan to kill her is another compelling dramatic scene, also with some more religious imagery if you wish to interpret it that way. The drama works a lot better in seeing both characters on the screen in these moments, and the panning lessens the impact. We keep having to go back and forth through the characters depending on who's in focus. But we reach the rousing speech section of the film, where the survivors take one last shot at another plan, and it's worth taking note of some of the issues the audience is left dealing with. This is the first time we see the group of other surviving prisoners since the explosion, keeping in mind we don't have the additional scenes that we had in the assembly cut. The dilemma is we have to wonder, who's still alive? Do we know who they are, and do we care? It's a valid criticism, I think that's fair. But the already existing flaws are exacerbated in the 4x3 version because characters are cut off of the screen in certain shots. Now if there's one thing I can give the full screen VHS presentation a little affirmation for is that, I guess because of the lower definition, the rod puppet effects, all too often mistaken for early 90s CGI, actually become a little bit more digestible. Funnily enough, it seems that the best, highest definition possible only serves to highlight the flawed effects. The practical effects, no doubt, hold up like gangbusters. They're wonderful. ADI did some incredible work with the puppetry and costume effects and compositing the two just about seamlessly. However, there's nothing seamless about throwing the photochemically composited rod puppet into the mix, but for the time in a pre-CGI world, I stand by that it's impressive for what it is. There's fantastic camera work in the lead work sequence. Needless to say, it's hindered by the square aspect ratio, but it comes across without too many noticeable issues. I do like how we see Jude's legs flailing here in this shot, which sadly can't be seen in 4x3. Scenes outside of the lead works during this entire sequence require some panning, though. A shot of the satellites as the ship approaches. Both times we see the company on their way to the entrance. They are large, wide, sprawling shots, and the information on screen just has to be followed by this method at the risk of losing it all. Sometimes the action within the lead works can be hard to follow due to the aspect ratio change. Like here, when Ripley and Dylan are luring in the alien, Morse, who has been missing from the action for some time, appears, making it clear he's right behind them. This is missing in 4x3, so really he just kind of appears out of nowhere in the next shot in the full screen version. It's at this point where I really just can't help but wonder how the home video release could have been saved by using the open matte technique while filming. 
This was something I mentioned in the previous video about AVP's full-screen version. It was a popular practice at this time. Movies like Terminator 2 and Jurassic Park used the method to some great success in the early 90s, so it's not as if it was this rare thing. I understand the artistic vision of a director and the need to film in a certain way, but at this time it was inevitable that the home video VHS release would alter the vision anyway. But was it Fincher's decision or the studio's? Maybe it was the studio's, because I'd imagine filming all that extra image for a print would come at a cost. And when you're shooting without a script, not knowing what the hell is going to end up in the final cut anyway, then yeah, that's going to add up. I'm sure in this case, the eventual home video release was the last thing on their minds, and when the time came, the approach was the same as the film itself. Just get it done. However you can get it done, just get it done. Ripley defeats the alien, it blows up real good, Bishop makes his presence known as the film's final moments unfold, and our heroine has to make a difficult decision. We have some missing things here, such as Aaron out of frame, pondering his role in alliance with the company. Some awkward panning across the fencing to show all of the company workers present, and the scale of the ledge where Ripley will be falling from. Ripley chooses the greater good, makes the ultimate sacrifice, and Alien 3 reaches its conclusion. The very last shot we see is the image of the computer screen summing up the events, and it is a squeezed image to fit the screen. A fitting end to a pan and scan nightmare. And that's the Alien Trilogy, pan and scan version. In hindsight, it's hard to believe just how much these movies were altered in order to make them available for the standard television set at the time. It really makes me grateful for what we have today and how any new viewers of the series will be able to be introduced to the films in the intended aspect ratios. Sure, anyone can find these tapes at a thrift store or eBay and watch these versions, but as it stands, it would purely be for novelty. At the time, for fans of the series, it was out of necessity. There simply was no other alternative to watching these movies at home, years off from their original theatrical releases. To Fox's credits, they always made these movies widely available, and always seemed to be making slight improvements with the VHS presentations as they became available, right up to the bitter end of the format. And to be fair, I do have to credit those who worked on the pan and scan presentations of these movies because there was no other way to get these on home video for the average home viewer who I'm sure would find a letterbox formatting questionable. If the role of the film projectionist, as I mentioned earlier, is a lost art, then surely the role of the pan and scanner is, too. And on the whole, probably underappreciated, not given the proper credit during this era of home video. Not that I long for those days to return, but it was a dirty job and somebody had to do it, and I'd say they did it well. Or at least, as well as they could. And I'd be lying if I said I didn't have a certain nostalgia for my VHS alien tapes, because I do. This was the format I used to first watch the original four movies. I have some great memories of them. And where I, and others in the same boat as me, benefit is that we're able to appreciate how far the movies have come over the years with their at-home presentations. The improvements that have been made and the quality that has been available to viewers over the past few decades is truly incredible. I value being able to witness that firsthand and unfold over the years in my own life. You can watch these movies over and over again, and you can get a different experience each time as the technology changes. You can appreciate the artistry that goes behind these movies even further. You can notice new things. I was a kid when I first saw these movies. Pan and scan, full screen aspect ratio, these things meant nothing to me. Were unheard of concepts. I was just watching cool movies that I loved, and regardless of the formatting, their quality was able to shine through. As I grew and matured, so did the home video technology, and because of the two coinciding, I was able to appreciate it more. In a technical way, and in the kind of way you respond to art emotionally. I and others like me have a unique perspective that way. Of all the times to be alive in human history, in all of the existence of art and of film, and the ability for us to enjoy that art all aligned in such a precise way that no one else before us had that experience and no one after us will. I think that's pretty amazing. I think that's worth celebrating. So if you happen to have a copy of Alien on VHS or the trilogy hiding around somewhere in storage, maybe pick it up and dust it off a little bit. Just hold it and admire it, if nothing else. If you still have a VCR, then maybe give it a watch for old time's sake. But remember to be cautious, because on VHS, no one can see the whole screen. 
I'd like to thank you very much for watching today, going through this long video. I really appreciate it. If you enjoyed this video, please make sure to give it a like, and be sure to subscribe for all the latest videos from the channel. My very special thanks goes out to Brandon James, Xeno Shadowmorph, and Xenozip, Queen Tears of the Patreon Hive. Thank you to Gregory Ford and John Griggs, the Hive's Praetorians. A very special thanks to Lady Anne in the Ellen Ripley Tier of Excellence. And thank you, thank you very much, Nicholas Butta and Frank, the Alien Theory Wayland yutani executives. I'll be back again soon with more videos. In the meantime, you can follow me on social media. Follow at Alien underscore Theory on TikTok for some fun video extras. And follow at Alien Theory YT on Facebook and Instagram for more. And until next time, this is Alien Theory, signing off.